Pure Marquette 1225, Michigan's Steam Star. In this video, we travel to the Mitten to visit this magnificent burke as she pulls the annual North Pole Express from Owasso to Ashley, Michigan. We also get to see LTEX 310, a classic EMD F40 PHR, as it pulls the North Pole Express back to Owasso. Now let's hop aboard and get this journey started. On the weekend of December 11th and the 12th, my sibling and I were invited up to Michigan by our friends Brandon and Tyler to come and see Pure Marquette 1225, a beautiful 284 Berkshire. During our stay, we stayed in Lansing, Michigan, and on both mornings before we got to Owasso, we managed to see another passenger train. On December 11th, we found ourselves at the Schumann Road Railroad Crossing, east of Lansing, Michigan. Here, we caught Amtrak's Blue Water, train 365, as it roared by the crossing. It was being led by Amtrak 4622, and on the rear was Amtrak 4627, two SC44 Charger locomotives, built by Siemens in 2017. Now let's move to my second camera to get another angle at this. The next day, on December 12th, we relocated to the nearby Green Road Railroad Crossing, where we yet again see the Blue Water. Amtrak's Blue Water is an inner-city passenger train that travels from Chicago, Illinois, 
to Port Huron, Michigan, with major stops in Flint, Lansing, and Kalamazoo, Michigan. The train is operated as part of Amtrak's Michigan service with two other trains, the Wolverine from Chicago, Illinois to Pontiac, Michigan via Detroit, and the Pure Marquette from Chicago, Illinois to Grand Rapids, Michigan. After the blue water got by, we'll now move to Owasso, Michigan. Founded in 1859, Owasso is the largest city in Shiawassee County. It is also the home of the famed Steam Railroading Institute. The SRI was first founded in 1969 as the Michigan State University Railroad Club with the goal of restoring Pure Marquette 1225 but, to tell the story of the group, we have to first start with the history of 1225. Pierre Marquette 1225 began life in October of 1941 and was built by the Lima Locomotive Works in Lima, Ohio for the Pierre Marquette Railroad. She was part of the second order of Berkshires built for the railroad and was labeled as an N1. Besides the N1s, there are also the original N Berkshires built in 1937, and later on in 1944, the N2s. The Pier Marquette Railroad had a total of 39 Berkshires to haul their fast freight trains all over their system. 1225, along with her sister engines, only worked for the Pier Marquette Railroad for six years, when in 1947, the Pier Marquette Railroad was merged into the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad. 1225 continued her career with the CNO for four more years until she was retired in 1951 in favor of the diesel locomotives. Despite being retired, she and her sister engines stayed in storage until 1957 when 1225 herself was saved from scrap with the help of Forrest Akers. Forrest Akers was the vice president of the Michigan State University and saw 1225 as a real piece of machinery for engineering students to study. After being moved to Michigan State's main campus, she stayed on display there until 1969, when a group of students there took interest in her. Which brings us to the beginning of the Michigan State University Railroad Club. Their first goal was to restore 1225 and operate it for excursions to football games there. Then, on October 5, 1975, after six years of hard work, the MSURC first fired up 1225 on main campus. It was mainly to test the boiler and some rebuild parts the group had worked on. Then, in 1982, the group was reorganized as the Michigan State Trust of Railway Preservation, Inc., and after 1225 was donated to them, she was then moved to the old Ann Arbor Railroad steam locomotive back shops in Owasso, Michigan to be finished of the restoration. In 1985, the restoration of 1225 was completed as she was fired up and moved under her own power for the first time since her retirement. Ever since then, she has pulled many excursion trains not only in the state of Michigan, but also out of state as well. The group also later renamed themselves 
to the Steam Railroading Institute after finishing the restoration. In 2014, my dad, brother, and I got to see this Burke for the first time at Train Expo 2014 when Pure Marquette 1225 and famed Nickel Plate Road 765 last met. Train Expo 2014 was basically a big gathering of steam with the main stars being 1225 and 765. The other steam engines included Lehigh Valley Coal Company number 126, Visco Company number 6, Flag Coal Company 75, Central Pacific 63 Leviathan, Little River Railroad number 1, and Little River Railroad number 110. The date we were there was June 21st, 2014, and we saw Pier Marquette 1225 as it was pulling in to Owasso after finishing its Alma excursion. During the event, both 1225 and 765 were running long excursions from Owasso, Michigan to Alma, Michigan over the Great Lakes Central Railroad. We got to see Pier Marquette 1225 just east of the Michigan Avenue Railroad Crossing. For this event, 1225 was fitted with a near replica of an N&W J-Class whistle. We'll now listen to it as the engine approaches the Michigan Avenue Railroad Crossing. During this trip, I was hoping to chase Pier Marquette 1225 on this route, but thanks to not knowing which days or times 1225 was scheduled to pull the train, we missed out on it, and I had to settle with just chasing 765 on the run. Ever since then, I've been trying to get back up here to see 1225, but things just kept getting in the way until now. I covered this trip in my first big hit video Train Expo 2014, Owasso, Michigan, which was the 14th episode of my train adventure video series. In normal cases of talking about old videos, other people would encourage viewing it, but in this case, I wouldn't. Despite my old video on Train Expo 2014 being one of my first major hits on YouTube, the audio I recorded for that video was abysmal, and my narration was pretty bad. I hope someday to redo the video in question, but I don't have a set schedule for when that's going to happen. So if you wish to view the video and you don't mind bad audio, go right ahead. And also, if you're watching this video someday after I remake Train Expo 2014, I hope you liked it. Anyway, now let's get back to 2021. As I said in the beginning, Pure Marquette 1225 was set to pull the North Pole Express from Owasso to Ashley, Michigan, over the tracks of the Great Lakes Central Railroad. In this video, I'll be combining footage from both the 11th and the 12th to make more of a seamless run. So, in some shots, it will be a sunny day, which was the 12th, and on the days when it was cloudy and windy, that was the 11th. We'll begin our chase along East Howard Street, right next to the Steam Railroading Institute and the Great Lake Central's main line. On the 12th, we got to see 1225 as it glistened in the morning sun. 
Soon enough, it was time for the run to begin, and we got to watch one of the most dramatic departures I've ever seen from any locomotive thus far. That shot reminded me of a daylighted version of the front cover of the famed book, The Polar Express, which we'll get back to in a little bit. Anyway, after seeing 1225 there, we then moved to the West Main Street Railroad Crossing, west of South Chipman Street, still in Owasso. It's important to make this distinction, as there are two West Main Street Railroad Crossings on both sides of South Chipman Street. I know where the 1225 train is at. Oops. It's all right. We'll get, it's all right. Well, I know. I know. All right. Here we go. I live here in Owasso, so I know. All right. My son's actually a car host on the train. Oh, cool.
the rear end of the North Pole Express was LTEX 310, which we'll also get back to later on. After seeing 1225 here in Owasso, the next place we caught the train at was in Carland, Michigan. Here in the small community is the Carland Elevator, one of the most famous spots along the route. Unfortunately, when the 2021 North Pole Express began back near the end of November, some rail fans proceeded to do, well, um, how should I put this, a pretty bad stunt here on the tracks. I'm not going to tell what they did, but it was enough to get law enforcement to monitor the people here. The Steam Railroading Institute also employed a group of people to follow ahead of the train and monitor the rail fans at most of the spots along the way. Also, thanks to the stunt, whoever owned the Carland Elevator proceeded to place a number of highway traffic cones all around the driveway of the facility. Despite law enforcement and traffic cones, this didn't stop everyone from coming out to see 1225. A little bit after arriving in Carland, we then began to hear the whistle of 1225 in the distance and got set up to watch it as it rolled through. Now, let's get back to why I mentioned the book, The Polar Express. To begin with, the book, if for whatever reason you don't know, is a children's book written and illustrated by Chris Van Alsberg in 1985. He's also well known for writing the book, Jimunji, back in 1981, and also won two Caldecott medals for writing both books. So, what does 1225 have to do with the book? Well now, Chris Van Alsberg was born on June 18, 1949, in East Grand Rapids, Michigan. As a child, his family would often attend every home football game played at Michigan State University. When 1225 was put on display at Michigan State, she was displayed next to Spartan Stadium. As a child, Van Alsberg would not only see the locomotive, but play on the engine as well. During the chase, I had my sibling manning the second camera to get more shots of 1225.
Getting back to Van Alsberg, he would later state that Pierre Marquette 1225 was part of the main inspiration for the book, as the number on the locomotive inspired him, as it reminded him of December 25th, Christmas Day, or 12-25. After seeing 1225 in Carland, the next place we saw the train at was at the West Henderson Road Railroad Crossing, east of Elsie, Michigan. On both the 10th and 11th of December, a potent storm swept across the central United States. During this storm, multiple tornadoes touched down, particularly in the state of Kentucky. The hardest hit town was Maysfield, Kentucky, as the town was hit by the strongest tornado made by the storm, an EF-4. My heart goes out to the families that were affected by both the storm and the tornadoes, especially the people of Maysfield, Kentucky. I'm sorry for you guys' losses, and I hope you guys are able to pull through this tough time. In Michigan, the storm resulted in high winds sweeping across the state. From what I heard, the winds on this day managed to blow down a big tree branch down onto the line, which significantly delayed the North Pole Express for a couple of hours. Luckily, the crews of the Great Lakes Central Railroad were able to remove the tree, and the train was able to get back up and running, despite being very late. Getting back to the book about the Polar Express, the book was later adapted into the computer animated movie The Polar Express. During the movie's production, Warner Brothers approached the Steam Railroading Institute about studying the locomotive as they wanted to model the locomotive for their movie. Not only did SRI agree to this, but they also gave Warner Brothers copies of 1225 blueprints so that the modeling team at the studio could use it. They also allowed Warner Brothers to record the sounds of 1225, so they could make the model sound almost exactly like 1225. The only sound they didn't use was 1225's whistle. The whistle used in the movie was from Sierra Railway No. 3. As a result, the movie got a great looking locomotive that resembled 1225. Ever since the movie's release back in 2004, many people now know 1225 as the real Polar Express engine.
next place we saw the North Pole Express at was at the North Polster Road Railroad Crossing in Elsie, Michigan. The next place we saw the train at was in Bannister, Michigan. Here, 1225 came to a stop south of town. It was more than likely to let the Great Lakes Central High Rail trucks drive on ahead of the train to make sure that the line was clear of debris. Soon after letting the high rail trucks get by, 1225 was allowed to get back underway.
After seeing the North Pole Express in Bannister, Michigan, we then saw the train again at the East Cleveland Road slash Route 57 Railroad Crossing southeast of Ashley, Michigan. The last place we saw the train at was at the South McCullen Road Railroad Crossing, also southeast of Ashley, Michigan. Here we got to see the high rail trucks as they got off the main line. Once the high rail trucks were out of the way, the headlight of 1225 was spotted in the distance, and we got set up to watch the Burke one more time before it arrived into Ashley, Michigan. After seeing the train there, the last place we caught the train at was in Ashley, Michigan. Here we got parked and walked into town and joined the many people at the North Sterling Street slash East Oak Street Railroad Crossing located in the middle of town. Here we got to watch as 1225 pulled its train right into the middle of Ashley, Michigan.
train now in Ashley, the passengers began to disembark to explore town. While they were doing that, now let's go to the rear end of the train. As you guys saw on the way up, on the rear of the North Pole Express was LTEX 310, a classic EMD F40PHR. The engine was built in 1985 for Amtrak as their 392. The engine worked for Amtrak, pulling many of their luxurious passenger trains until it was displaced in the 1990s by the newer Genesis series locomotives. In 2004, 392 was then sold off to the Virginian Railway Express, a commuter rail system in eastern Virginia. There, it hauled commuter passenger trains and was renumbered as V31. In 2010, V31 was then sold again to the Agent Metropolitan de Transport, or AMT, in Montreal, Quebec. It was finally given its current number, 310, and again pulled commuter passenger trains out of Montreal, Quebec, until 2015, when again it was sold to the San Luis Central Railroad. It was then leased to the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, where it continued doing its job. In 2018, it was then sold one more time to Larry's Truck and Electric, and in 2021, began being leased to the SRI. With all the passengers now off the train, 310 began to pull the train back down the line, so that 1225 could sit on display at the crossing.
With the train now in position, the festivities could begin. The town of Ashley, Michigan was founded in 1884 and, as of the 2010 census, had a population of 563 people. Of course, with the train's arrival, the population of the small town was increased for a short time. During our visit, in conjunction with the North Pole Express, the town was hosting the Village of Ashley Country Christmas 2021 event. Besides getting your picture with the famed Burke 1225, you could also shop at the Ashley Marketplace, ride around town in a horse-drawn carriage, and get spooked? Yes, indeed. Ashley is home to the Hinterland Haunted Attraction, which was having a holiday fright, as they put it. And to top this all off, one of the children on board the train would be chosen by Santa Claus himself to receive the first gift of Christmas. Definitely an interesting experience. After some time got by, the first gift of Christmas was given, and afterwards, 1225 began to pull the train back across the railroad crossing so that the passengers could reboard the train for the run back to Owasso. With the train preparing to board the passengers, we took the opportunity to get set up down the line. For the return journey, the first place we caught the train at was back at the South McCullen Road Railroad Crossing, southeast of town. As the train begins its journey back to Owasso, let's get back to the history of 310. This particular engine is a special case, as when EMD first made this class of locomotive beginning in 1975, they were labeled as F40PHs. So why does 310 have the R on the end? Well, to explain that, we have to mention another passenger locomotive EMD built 
called the SDP-40Fs. The SDP-40Fs were built between 1973 and 1974 and were intended by Amtrak to be their long-distance passenger train haulers. When the F-40PHs were introduced, they planned on using those locomotives on their short-haul passenger runs. After seeing the train at the railroad crossing, we then returned to Bannister, Michigan to see the train roll through town there. While back in Bannister, the winds were particularly violent right now, as it nearly blew down my camera. Getting back to the SDP-40Fs, unfortunately for them, they were plagued with problems. Train crews would report that the engines rode poorly when compared to the EMDE units they replaced. As the careers of the SDP-40Fs continued, unfortunately, the engines would be involved in a series of derailments that would lead to the end of their careers. The next place we caught 310 at was along East Island Road, east of Elsie, Michigan. Again, getting back to the history of the SDP-40Fs, they were equipped with steam generators and water tanks back in those days in order to heat the passenger cars which used steam heating. Investigators investigating the derailments of the SDP-40Fs theorized that the steam generators and the water tanks on board made the back of the SDP-40Fs way too heavy and possibly created too much lateral motion. The FRA investigators later concluded that due to the lightweight baggage cars being coupled directly behind the much heavier SDP-40Fs, the baggage cars tended to get harmonic vibrations. Combining it with the lateral motion created by the locomotives shook themselves right off the tracks. The next place we saw the North Pole Express at was along North Venson Road as it crossed the West Rowley Road Railroad Crossing, halfway between Carland and Elsie, Michigan. Once again, getting back to the SDP-40Fs, 
on top of all the problems, on some parts of the U.S. rail network, track conditions were poor, which also contributed to the SDP-40F's derailments. By 1977, Amtrak had enough of their SDP-40F's and decided to use their much more successful F-40PH locomotives all over their passenger system, which brings us back to 310. The next place we saw the train at was at the North Ruiz Road Railroad Crossing, southeast of Carland, Michigan. Between 1977 and 1987, Amtrak traded 132 of their SDP-40Fs to receive 132 of EMD's F-40PHRs. The F-40PHRs were simply F-40PHs but used SDP-40F parts such as the prime movers to make them. As a result of the program, 310 was built. The last place we saw the train before arriving in Owasso was at the Mason Road slash North Delaney Road Railroad Crossing just northwest of town. If you wish to know more about the SDP-40Fs or any other locomotives used by Amtrak, such as the F-40PHs, I would recommend starting with Engines of Amtrak, a show that discusses the history of every locomotive built specifically for Amtrak. The series was created by Amtrak Guy 365 right here on YouTube, and that's where I got some of my information from for this video. After seeing the train there, the last place we saw the North Pole Express at was at the South Washington Street Railroad Crossing, just across the road from the Steam Railroading Institute in Owasso, Michigan.
Despite being at the end of the journey, we managed to see 1225 again as the locomotive was backing down into the Great Lake Central's yard in town here to be readied for the afternoon run. Thanks to the tree branch that fell onto the line earlier that day, the afternoon train had a night departure. We are now at the South Michigan slash Route 52 railroad crossing, where we see 1225 as it rolls across the railroad crossing at night. As a quick side note, in this shot, you're going to observe a number of motorists racing across the railroad crossing as the train gets closer. Please remember not to do this. Not only is this dangerous, but it's also illegal as well. After the train got by, we then decided to go out into the night and see the train a few more times in the dark. The next place we saw the train at was at the West Wilkinson Road Railroad Crossing, northwest of Owasso. Here it was pitch black, and if you look to the right of your screen, you'll start seeing the headlights of 1225, and the light on the left side were motorists 
coming up the road. Knowing what had happened at the last crossing, I got a little bit worried that these motorists might have tried to cross the railroad crossing here, so I moved back off the road just in case that happened. After seeing the train there, the next place we saw the train at was at the West Judeville Road Railroad Crossing in Carland, Michigan. The last place we saw the North Pole Express at was at the North Meridian Road Railroad Crossing in Elsie, Michigan. And now, with the North Pole Express's passing, we are now at the end of our adventure with 1225. The Steam Railroading Institute runs a fine operation, and it was great getting to see this Burke after a long absence. If you wish to know when 1225 is operating, I encourage you guys to go and see the Steam Railroading Institute's website at https colon slash slash www.michigansteamtrain.com There, they post when they plan on operating their Berkshire during the year, and you can purchase tickets for those excursions as well there. They also have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube account as well, so I also encourage you guys to check that out as well if you're interested. Also, I wish to thank Brandon and his brother Tyler for inviting us to come and see Pure Marquette 1225. Brandon runs the YouTube channel Nickel Plate Studios and has recently released his own video on Pure Marquette 1225. So, after seeing this video, 
I encourage you to check out his video along with his YouTube channel. He makes absolutely great content and deserves to be seen. Also, everything else I mentioned in this video will be linked down below in the description box, so you can go check that out there. Well guys, we are now at the end of the video. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Winter was warm, summer soft and here that winter